Our sermon passage this morning comes from Mark 6, verses 13 through 30. And they cast out many, de many demons and anointed with oils many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had, been, had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, ask, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. The root of suffering is attachment. So said Gautama, the Buddha, the enlightened one. Now, if you know the history, Gautama went from being an Indian prince to embracing the life of an austere monk. His change in life was to understand this one question. How can one be free from suffering? Now, to answer this, he came up with his four noble truths. The truth of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the road to reach that end. That road is called the Eightfold Path. It is the path that is followed by nearly 500 million Buddhists today. According to the Buddha, desire was the cause of suffering. Especially a desire for pleasure. Therefore, to remove suffering, one must first remove desire, remove attachment. In the Buddhist system, this is ultimately reached when one attains nirvana, which is a transcendent state where the cycles of reincarnation are finally broken. So friend, I wonder about you. Have you come here this morning in a time of acute suffering? Is there a crisis even now looming on your horizon? If so, is detachment from desire your only option? Is there any other way for you to understand your suffering? To help us answer that question, we turn this morning to the gospel according to Mark. So if you have your copy of the scriptures, please turn to the passage that was read, Mark chapter 6. Now as you turn there, we're going to break this passage up into two parts. First, we'll consider the conviction of the righteous. Righteous. 
And second, we'll consider the conspiring of the wicked. The conviction of the righteous and the conspiring of the wicked. Notice first the conviction of the righteous. Mark 6, verse 17. It reads, For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, we are introduced in these verses to the family of Herod. This family shows up several times in the Gospels and the book of Acts. We remember that it was Herod the Great who had called for the death of all the baby boys in Bethlehem. Herod the Great had ten wives. And after he died, his sons became tetrarchs. They became rulers over a fourth of the land of Israel. Now, the son we are introduced to in Mark 6 is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is famous for his interactions with Jesus, as we'll see this morning, and his interactions with John the Baptist. His son, Herod Agrippa, is the one that Paul gives his defense to in Acts 25. So when you think of Herod, think of a family name. A name for one of the most debauched royal families to ever rule the land of Israel. You've already heard the extent of the debauchery. Look at verse 17 again. Herod had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Why? Because he had married her. Now, Herod was already married when he met Herodias for the first time in Rome. He then quickly divorced his wife, convinced Herodias to divorce her husband, and then they got married. But her previous husband happened to be Philip, the half-brother of Herod. Now, to make things even more nasty, Herodias was the daughter of another half-brother of Herod and Philip. So not only has Herod Antipas here married his half-brother's ex-wife, Herodias was also his niece. So that's nasty with a side of nasty. (laughs) Now, all of this brought about the condemnation of the last and greatest Old Testament prophet. Look at verse 18. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Did you hear that? What does John appeal to in that text? He's appealing to the law. It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Where is he getting that from? Well, he's getting it from the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.16 says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. Leviticus 20, verse 21, if a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Now, being confronted with the law of God, you would have hoped that Herod and Herodias would have repented. But they did not. They didn't like the message, so they chose instead to silence the messenger. Herod imprisoned John, and we read in verse 19, put your eyes on verse 19, Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Now here we come to one of the most interesting verses in the text. We see that Herodias wanted nothing but John's death. But Herod, Herod feared him. He even kept him safe. He heard him gladly. Isn't that a fascinating statement? 
Though he rejected everything that John had said, he still could not shake the presence of the man. Why? Well, I think it's because John's words and demeanor haunted Herod's conscience. It was a voice that he could not subdue. You know, it reminds me of the association that Benjamin Franklin, one of the founders of this nation, shared with George Whitfield. We remember Whitfield, right? The mighty evangelist of the Great Awakening. And though Franklin was no Christian, he could not help but come and listen to Whitfield. One reporter once asked him, Sir Franklin, why do you listen to Whitfield? You don't believe a word he says. To which Franklin responded, that's true, but he does. It was the sheer gravity of a man of conviction that attracted Franklin. So my Christian friend, I wonder if the same could be said about you. Do your co-workers and friends know you to be a person of Christian conviction? When you're in the group, are you the one who is bold to speak the truth in gentleness and love? Or do you fear to own Christ's name? Do you blush to hear of his cause? Well, one thing we know is that people of conviction draw the attention of the world. And yet this attention is hardly ever positive. So having considered the conviction of the righteous, notice secondly the conspiring of the wicked. Look at verse 21. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. Now we read that an opportunity came. The who's who of Galilee is here. And we find out that Herodias was only biding her time. In wait like a serpent, ready to strike at an opportune moment. And we're told that the moment arrives on Herod's birthday. Now even as we read of this birthday party, we know this will not be good. Of all the instances of birthday parties in the Bible, someone always dies. Did you know that? <laughs> you remember Pharaoh in Genesis 40. What happened on his birthday party? Well, he executed his baker. You remember Job's children. They all die while celebrating their olders, oldest brother's day. And so too, in this birthday party, it will end with death. Notice what Herodias has her daughter do. Look at verse 22. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Now, typically, the dancing at a party like this would have been performed by the professional court dancers. But in this case, Herodias is so vile that she's going to accomplish her purposes through her teenage daughter, a member of the royal household. You can picture the scene, can't you? It's a bunch of drunk dignitaries getting a raunchy dance at a raucous party. According to verse 22, it pleased them. We can safely assume that this was no two-step. So, in his drunkenness, what does Herod do? He promises her whatever she wants, right? Now, when he makes that promise, he's echoing the same words that Xerxes gave to Esther in the Old Testament. Whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. Mark wants you to hear that echo in the phraseology. In both instances, the phrases come out of the mouth of a debased king. Someone who could not control his tongue. In both events, a promise was made which unwittingly unmasked evil. You remember that with Xerxes, it was Haman's plot. Well, with Herod, 
It is Herodias' plot. This is the opportunity she's been waiting for. Look at verse 24. And she, that is Herodias' daughter, went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Like the Jezebel of old, Herodias works around a weak-willed king to seek an innocent man's blood. The perils between Herodias and Jezebel are even made stronger when we realize that Jezebel also sought the blood of Elijah. What does the New Testament call John the Baptist? The one who comes in the spirit of Elijah, right? So how... Uh, see how Herodias, daughter of Elijah, look at verse 25. Notice what she does. Verse 25, and she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now we must ask, is this girl just a pawn in her mother's devious schemes? Not at all. All Herodias said was that she wanted John's head, right? Her daughter asked for it at once. Her daughter asked for it on a platter. The apple hasn't fallen far from that tree. So what will Herod do? He used to fear John. He was greatly perplexed at listening to him. And he heard him gladly. Will he now grow a spine? Will he rebuke the girl? Well, sadly, no. Look at verse 26. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Remember who we are speaking about here. This is none other than John the Baptist, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. He stood boldly against the Pharisees, calling them a brood of vipers. Jesus himself said that there was no one born that was more important or greater than John the Baptist. Malachi describes him as the Elijah to come before the great and awesome day of the Lord. He is the linchpin between the old and the new covenant, as we heard from Brother Robert last week. So why did he die? What led to the death of the greatest Old Testament prophet? Well, it was because a weak ruler wanted to save face in front of his drunk friends. Let that sink in. The greatest prophet since the Old Testament dies because a weak ruler wanted to save face in front of his drunk friends. Such is the incongruence that Mark wants you to feel. It is the conviction of the righteous being silenced by the conspiring of the wicked. Now, how do we piece all of this together? What are we supposed to learn? Well, let me suggest three things. First, the suffering of the innocent under weak rulers foreshadows the suffering of the Christ. Let me say that again. The suffering of the innocent under weak rulers foreshadows the suffering of the Christ. Now, as you read through the scriptures, you begin to pick up accounts of weak kings who get entrapped by their words. You remember the story of Daniel, right? How King Darius was tricked into signing a law that no one would pray to anyone except him for 30 days. And it sounded like a good idea, so he signed it. But it was a trap. A trap by his courtiers to ensnare Daniel, the king's most trusted administrator. 
Now, Daniel, being a godly man, does not pray to the king, but rather to his God. And by the time Darius figures this out, he's got no choice. He must put Daniel to death. He must throw Daniel to the lions. Darius, like Herod, is greatly saddened by what he must do, but he's trapped because of his words, which are now the law. He's being pressured by the who's who of Persia. You remember the story. Daniel is thrown in the den and then a great stone is rolled over the entrance. In that case, God indeed saved his man. Now, as you continue reading the scriptures, you pass the account that we've looked at this morning and you come to another similar situation in the Gospels. Pilate, too, was afraid of the man before him, having heard that this man claimed to be the Son of God, the King of the Jews. Now, he knew it was out of envy that the chief priests had accused him because... Here was a righteous man, a holy man. But the who's who of Jerusalem wanted his blood. And so Mark 15, 15 says, Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Another weak ruler who wants to save face before the crowd. Wishing to satisfy the crowd. Messiah is killed and thrown into a tomb because of the weakness of a political ruler. And just like Daniel, a large stone is rolled over the entrance of his demise. Listen, Darius and Herod are meant to prepare you for that encounter with Pilate. And yet there's more to that last account. We know of it, right? Remember how the church in Jerusalem prayed, Acts chapter 4. They said, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. That's Acts chapter 4. Verse 28. That's a prayer addressed to God. Herod and Pontius Pilate conspired against your son, they say. But they could only do what God had predestined to take place. Now, does that mean that Herod and Pilate were puppets? No, we see that they clearly did exactly what they wanted to do. And yet, and yet, what they intended for evil, namely the death of the innocent, God intended for good, namely the salvation of his people. Even as we sang, whatever my God ordains is right. Thus the scriptures prepare us to see that the suffering of the innocent under weak rulers foreshadows the suffering of the Christ. Now a second thing we can learn from this text is that the suffering of John the Baptist parallels the suffering that all of Jesus' disciples must endure. Let me repeat that. The suffering of John the Baptist parallels the suffering that all of Jesus' disciples must endure. So look back at Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, put your eyes on verse 12. Notice how our story is placed. Mark chapter 6 verse 12 speaks of Jesus sending his disciples to preach. Verse 12 reads, so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So the account of the beheading of John begins with a call for preaching. With Jesus sending out his disciples. Notice how it ends. Look down at verse 30. 
the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Now, isn't that interesting? The account of John's death is sandwiched between the disciples being sent out and the disciples returning. What does Mark want to tell us? Well, he wants to tell us that the cost of discipleship is death. The cost of discipleship is death. Is that not what Jesus himself said? Mark chapter 8, he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is the cost of calling people to repent. And John knew it all too well. Listen, the scriptures make clear that there is a tight connection between mission and martyrdom. Between discipleship and death. So church, I wonder if your evangelism makes that connection clear. Are you telling people to count the cost before coming to follow Jesus? Or are you trying to push them and rush them into some form of decision? Many of you know David Lawrence. He is one of our missions partners in the Middle East. I remember speaking with him years ago about the usual structure that we use to communicate the gospel. God, man, Christ. We know it all too well at this church. God is holy. Man has sinned. Christ has come to atone for that sin. And as a result of those truths, we call people to respond in repentance, to turn away from their sin and put their faith, their trust in Christ. But David told me that when he shares the gospel, he goes through God, man, Christ, which are the objective truths of what the gospel is. He calls for a response, and then he always ends with cost. God, man, Christ, response, cost. Because he wants to be upfront in telling people that there is a staggering cost to follow Jesus. Your life. I think he was doing the right thing. Did you know that Jesus actually turned people away from following him when they came to him? He would tell people who wanted to follow him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Are you ready to follow a homeless Messiah? Turn to the book of Luke in your copy of the scriptures. Turn to the book book of Luke, chapter 14. And hear the cost from Jesus' own lips. Luke chapter 14. And put your eyes on verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. How's that for seeker friendly? And that's not all. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Verse 29, otherwise when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31, a what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce All that he has cannot be my disciple. Could the words of Jesus be any more clear? Those who follow him must first count the cost. 
Friends, that is truth in advertising. That is no hidden fine print. So the suffering of John the Baptist parallels the suffering that Jesus calls all his disciples to endure. A third and final consideration. The purpose of Christian suffering. The purpose of Christian suffering. Turn in the scriptures to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's the passage that we read earlier in our responsive reading. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Aren't those glorious truths? We've been born again. We've been regenerated by God. And there is an inheritance waiting for us in heaven. Now notice how Peter applies that truth. Look at verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Church, that text is teaching you that you can rejoice in the midst of your momentary trials because of the hope of heaven. Through your trials, God is testing your faith to prove its genuineness. And one day, that very faith, which has been refined, will result in praise and glory to God when His Son comes to take us home. Listen, our hope is not in the extinguishing of attachment in nirvana. Our hope is in the full satisfaction of our desires at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The true end of suffering. Church, that is what sustained John. That is what sustained the disciples in the midst of their suffering. And that is what will sustain you. It will allow you to say boldly with the hymn writer, And Lord haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, And the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Let's pray. Father, teach us to rejoice in our trials. That our faith may be shown to be precious and genuine. For the glory of Christ we ask. Amen.